guys. My name is Todd. I have a new life in Christ, and I am recovering from an orphan spirit, fear, and pride. Well, welcome to Regeneration Big Group. I'm really glad that you made the decision to, to be here, to watch this, to participate. Uh, next week, the 14th, we're going to be live. That's exciting. I'm going to tell you a little bit more about that at the end of this, uh, kind of what to expect that evening. Uh, but before I do that, I want to just share a thought with you. Uh, this is maybe, it's, it's one of, I, I say my favorite, I feel like it's one of the most important ideas that many of us have to work through in this regeneration process but it's super valuable, it's so important that we begin to understand this truth and live in this truth. And that truth is in the Groundwork book. It's, it's day one, or week one, day one. And the lesson is entitled, God Loves You. And I think for me, I struggled with that idea for a lot of my life. I knew in my head, I knew the theology of Scripture that says God loves me. So I thought, well, I know that's true, but my head and my heart didn't always connect with that reality. Right? So what I mean by that is one thing to know something, but to really experience it or or feel it is really important too, right? Sometimes we need to connect the head and the heart, and that's part of how some things in our lives become reality, they become truth. And so for me, my first really round of recovery work, very similar to this, I had homework to do, it was a faith-based, uh, group then we would come back and we would process these things in our small group time that was really powerful for me but I remember one day uh, and man, I was in a bad place I and which this happens a lot right in this kind of recovery work sometimes there's a little excitement as you get going and then you kind of dig into it maybe it's kind of the middle part and some of the realities, some of the, the stuff you start to see, right? I'm seeing stuff about myself that I wasn't crazy about, but I'm also realizing, man, you've got to step into this. And, and I was really gotten in a bad place and feeling super isolated and alone and like nobody really cares that much. And I was... I remember I was in 1 John 3, and 1 John 3 says, and this was part of the lesson I was working on, right? And so I'm reading this, the scripture in 1 John 3 says, How great is the love of the Father that he has lavished on you that you would be called children of God. And I remember reading that and, and kind of having this moment of, Okay, again, I, I know that's true. God's Word says, right, that He loves me and that I'm a child of God, but I don't certainly never felt like He's lavished His love on me, right? That sounds excessive and a little much, but I thought, sounds cool too. But I remember as I'm reflecting on that text, and I look at, kind of glance over, and I've got a picture in my shelf at that time of my three children who were, who were young. This was in the, the mid-90s, so, you know, they're from two or three to six, maybe. And I remember looking at that picture and thinking, man, I love those kids. Like, they're, right, part of this, I'm trying to get healthy so that my, my children will experience the, the love of a father. And I kind of made this connection to that verse 
of man, what would it be like to lavish love on my children? Like, I want to be that dad. And it was like, right, when we talk about God speaking to us, maybe this, this is how it usually happens for me, where I feel kind of the Holy Spirit nudging something, right? It's rooted in this scripture that I just read. But I had this sense as if God was saying to me, Todd, I have a picture frame of you. I see you. I know you. And you are so loved because you're my child. You're my boy. And something just washed over me in a way it never had before. And I literally just started to weep. And not not sad tears, but just experiencing this reality that the God of creation really does love me. And that was a powerful moment for me. Something really began to shift from there moving forward. And I wasn't done. I'm still not done doing this work. But it was this foundational piece to really believe and realize that God, he loves me. He sees me. And that's not based on me being good, being sin free, right? I could make that connection as a father. Like, man, I love my kids just because they're my kids. And it was a powerful moment for me. And so I think about that in this idea, right, of God loves you. I think when... When have you experienced in your life unconditional love? Right? For many of us, eh, we don't have maybe a lot of experiences that come to mind. In fact, some people, based on their stories, might even say, I don't know that I've ever experienced truly unconditional love. Right? I've been married to my wife for 33 years. I'm still trying to figure out how to love her without conditions just because she's my wife and I chose her. Right? With my three children now are almost 30, 28, 26. And I'm trying to still work on how do I love them with no conditions just because they're my children. So I'm still trying to figure this out but I think I've improved, that I'm making progress. But I think it's rooted for me absolutely in this understanding today that God really does love me. He really wants to be in relationship with me. And I'm purposefully today, I'm in my counseling office and I'm I'm positioned this so in the backdrop, and I don't know how well you'll be able to see that, but it's, uh, it's a, obviously a copy of a Rembrandt. But I've had this in my counseling office or my church office for uh, over 15 years now. And it's, it's a very meaningful uh, piece of art for me. Rembrandt did some spirituals and this was his version of the return of the prodigal the luke 15 story and i began to realize as i spent time in that story i am truly all of those characters right if you're familiar with the story in luke 15 the three main players are the father the elder son and the younger son and the story we call it the return of the prodigal really we need to call the story the loving father and it's a great story for recovery right this younger boy basically throws his middle finger up at the father and says i'm out of here i don't care about you you don't care about me Not only am I out of here, 
but I want my inheritance. Like you owe me something. Now in real time, as Jesus is telling this story to a Jewish audience, what those responses would have been, a boy that does that might, and especially being the youngest in that culture, might get himself literally stoned. And I don't mean with weed, I mean with rocks. Because you would never say that to a father. It was the ultimate disrespectful thing. But it's fascinating. The father in this story, he says, son, man, if you don't want to be here, you are free to go. And not only are you free to go, like, I don't owe you anything, but I'll gladly bless you just because you're my boy. And so he gives him his inheritance. That boy runs off. And there's a lot of young uh, people do who are immature and trying to figure life out. He blows through that money in party and prostitutes and uh, just, right, just debauchery. Now, there's a beautiful line in that story. He's, he's gone from man around town having resources and friends and women and to now he has nothing and he's now he's a Jew working in a pigsty just the epitome of unclean because right pigs don't or Jews don't do pigs that's unclean they don't touch them they don't eat them they certainly don't feed them so he's gotten pretty low he's in the gutter and in the gutter there's a beautiful line in scripture it says and he came to his senses and he goes home he's like eh, maybe dad would at least let me be a servant right because his servants at least have a place to sleep and food to eat so this father he's just waiting and watching hoping Right? He wants relationship with this boy, his son. He loves him. And he just wants him to come home. And he's watching and he sees his son off in the distance. And again, very uncharacteristic of a Jewish father at this time. It would have been disrespectful, right? It wouldn't have been um, what, how a typical Jewish father would have responded but God doesn't respond to you and I the way some of our fathers did or didn't do. He doesn't respond like maybe a lot of typical fathers. This father in the story runs to his son and he throws his arms around him. And this boy's right, he's got his speech like, oh, father, I've, I've made all these mistakes. I'm so sorry. And right, and dad's like, da, da, da. no, 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 I don't, I don't want to hear any of that. I'm just so glad you're home and we're gonna have a party and we're gonna celebrate because my son who was lost has come home and so he restores his son right I love this picture because in the picture the head is shaven his one foot he's got this sandal he's dirty he's unclean but this father he doesn't care he just wants relationship. He loves his boy and he has his arms around him. So they're having a party, right? And the elder son, who I can relate to as well, right? The elder son's like, I'm not going to this stupid party for my young brother. Dad goes to him. He says, son, come on. We got to celebrate. Your brother, he came home. He was lost. And the elder son's like, I'm not celebrating, right? And, and he flips. He's like, I've been busting my tail. I've been doing everything right. You haven't thrown a party for me, right? He's got that self-righteous, like, just like the younger son, like, you owe me something. And the father again, he's like, son, everything I have is yours. But your brother who was lost, he's home. And we're going to celebrate. 
right? We really are all three of those characters. The story is about a loving father. And when you and I begin to understand that the God of creation truly loves us, he wants a relationship with you, and he doesn't care if you've been in the gutter or the pig pen. In fact, I think he, he maybe even makes special effort for that one because he realizes you're hurting. And he realizes maybe you question, how could he love you? He just wants relationship. He wants you to know how much you are loved. And when you and I begin to experience the love of God, man, that's a game changer. And so, right, part of this recovery work, as we work through our stuff of being a rebellious son who's gone off and done my own thing and it didn't work, or being a self-righteous son who says, hey, right, like I've been busting my tail, God kind of owes me something. I want to be like the Father, right? I want to, as I experience His love, I want to love others. I want to love my wife well. I want to love my children well. I want to love you well. We all have that in us to become the loving Father, the loving mother, right? This isn't a gender thing. We were created to love one another. But if you don't know the love of God, that love is going to be incomplete. Our motive gets all construed, right? And so God loves you. He wants you to know that. I love this verse, right? This is such a familiar verse in John 3, 16 and 17. 17 to me, maybe, right? It, it, it really takes verse 16 and does something else with it, right? So, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. And in verse 17, for God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. God's not condemning you for your sin and your mistakes and your, right? He's not. His whole plan was he wants to save us from ourselves. And so when we say that recovery is in Christ, it really is. But part of the process is beginning to understand that you are loved. You are of great value. The God of creation sees you. He wants relationship with you. He just needs us to come home. So, um, that is something probably all of us can continue, right? I continue to have a desire to grow in my understanding of God's love for me and in how I can love others. So let me pray and then tell you a little bit about next week. Father, we uh, are so grateful for your love. And I know for many of us, maybe listening to this, uh, we haven't really been able to grasp to understand to really experience the reality of your love so holy spirit i'm just praying for anyone that's listening to this that you would just whisper in their ear that they are a child of god that the god of creation wants to lavish his love on them that they are seen by him for who they truly are not for their sins or their mistakes or their hurts or their brokenness uh, but uh just seen for being a creation child and, and, and loved by God. So uh, we thank you for Jesus. I thank you for this ministry and the way you are moving into people's lives. And pray all of this in the name of Jesus. Amen. All right. So next week, September 14th, we will be live. And I want to ask you to do a couple of things. So we are following some of the protocol that, uh, right, the next weekend 
Um, we also will have uh, live services at Hope. And so we want to follow some of that same protocol and be consistent with that. So here's what we're, we're going to ask you to do. We're going to ask you to wear a mask into the building, right? Into the, when you're in moving around the building in the lobby and bathrooms and different spaces uh, to wear a mask. Now, once you get into the auditorium and you sit down for big group time, you can take your mask off. Uh, we want to be mindful of, right, we don't need to spread out all over that big auditorium, but uh, we don't also need to be sitting on top of each other. Uh, now, if you have some people there, right, that you've been doing life with and you want to sit together, that's fine. We're not going to police that, but just be mindful. Some people are going to want to keep some distance and there's plenty of space to find some distance. But during, during big group time and our worship time and the teaching time, uh, you're free to take your mask off. Once we wrap up big group and transition to small group, we're going to ask you to put your mask back on right as we're moving through the lobby in that space. Have a mask on. Uh, once you get into your small group, now right, this is up to you. If you want to keep your mask on, keep it on. There's not going to be any mask judgment. We're not doing that. Uh, now, we're, we're going to try to create those circles, right, with some space again. So in small group time, if you're comfortable to take that mask off, you're free to do that. Uh, but I'm just going to really ask that we give each other some grace. Uh, I want this to work. I want us to be able to continue to meet together. So uh, let's maybe think more about we than I, right? I know some people think the mask are silly. There's no reason to do it. I get that, right? And some people like are very uncomfortable to go anywhere without a mask. I get that too. So let's just respect one another and let's really think about, again, we, the community, uh, because we want to be able to continue to do this. And so, uh, and I'm looking forward to seeing everyone. Uh, we will continue to offer groundwork groups online and in step groups we'll determine, right, those of you that have been meeting, yeah, we're going to let you decide if you want to come back and finish up live or if you want to do that online. Uh, but uh, uh, excited to see everyone. So um, head to your small group and we'll see you next week.